This is Invisible Inc., the podcast for under-resourced women entrepreneurs. And I'm your host, Shubha Chakravarti, founder of Achieve. In this podcast, I talk to women entrepreneurs at every stage of their journey about the challenges, the highs, the lows, and what they've learned along the way. We'll also hear from experts who share valuable tips on how to succeed the smart way. Let's jump in. What if you want to pursue a social mission, but the nonprofit path doesn't quite feel like the right fit? Or you have an idea that requires technology, but you don't have millions in funding? How do you crack a concentrated B2B market as a small startup with a big mission? In this episode, nonprofit veteran turned social entrepreneur, Rochelle Naroki Gori, talks about how her social work on the south side of Chicago and her fruitful collaboration with a future U.S. president paved the way for her pioneering social venture that produces wins for both lenders and borrowers alike. Listen to Rochelle's insights on fundraising, staying true to mission, taking a strategic approach to growth, and much more. Now, here's Rochelle. So thank you, Rochelle, for joining us today. I'm delighted to have you. You're our first certified B Corp. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. I'm excited to chat with you today. So why don't we start with just Spring 4, what it does, just so we can understand what business you're in. So Spring 4, we're a certified B, as you mentioned, social impact fintech company, so financial technology company. Uh, we created our company in, all the way back in 2005. Really before I think there was fintech, I certainly had no idea what fintech financial technology meant. I was just really looking to solve a problem. But at the heart of our company is the belief that when people are experiencing financial challenges, it's because something is happening in their financial lives that makes it impossible for them to pay. So we've built a powerful database of over 20,000 vetted and curated financial health or financial wellness resources I'm trying to really understand why somebody cannot pay, connect them to local resources that can help them reduce their household expenses, increase cash flow, and get them paying and saving again. So we built technology that's utilized primarily by the financial services industry to help their borrowers connect to those resources. I did see, and you mentioned that you have a long history, even before Spring 4, I noticed that you have a tremendous amount of policy experience particularly in the housing area. So what gave you the idea? How did you move from policy to fintech? It seems like a rather big leap. Well, you're right. I've spent my entire career working in affordable housing, community reinvestment. I studied uh, pre-law and public policy undergrad, and then I started working in Chicago. And I had the good fortune to work with a very well-known nonprofit. In fact, my first boss, Gail Sincata, was known as the mother of the Community Reinvestment Act. So right from the get-go, I had the good fortune to be working alongside her and others Um, crafting policy and programs at the national level, but that would also take root at the local level to think about how do we help put people into home ownership opportunities. I was involved in some of the first ever pre-purchase counseling programs because back in the 90s, that was a new concept, right? Like we want to get people into home ownership. Let's create low down payment programs. Let's make certain they know what they're doing. So let's create this idea, this concept of pre-purchase counseling, something that's very, it's just something that's part of the industry today. And then from there, I moved on to work at Neighborhood Housing Services of Chicago. I worked with another pioneer there and did a lot of work around putting together programs and partnerships between financial institutions and nonprofits which led me in the early 2000s to do a lot of work on foreclosure intervention because the subprime market was taking off. There's two sides of every argument, but a lot of loans were being made that shouldn't be made. And a lot of families were getting into loans that were not set up to be sustainable. So because we worked at the community level, we were seeing the impacts of that and seeing that families were getting into trouble, were getting behind on their mortgage, didn't know where to turn for help, uh, created the first, some of the first ever foreclosure intervention programs. Chicago was the first city ordinance against predatory lending. We passed the first state regulations against predatory lending and actually had the good fortune of working with an Illinois state senator at the time, Mr. Barack Obama, who, you know, right. <laughs> so uh, I worked, you know, side by side with him to get that regulation passed. And it was really exciting. I had no idea that he was going to become our 
our future president. But um, that was a really interesting and, you know, a highlight of my career. And then in 2005, had this idea that we needed to do a better job, frankly, of connecting people who are experiencing financial challenges with programs and resources that could help them and understanding that when people experience financial challenges, they don't talk about it, they don't share it, there's a lot of shame attached to it. And banks weren't set up to know how to help their borrowers in that way. So so you have this idea, you see the market need, there's the market here, and the gap is here. What made you come up with the idea of a business? And how did you think about What's the first step? And then how did you yeah. kind of go from there to a business? Because everything sounds like a nonprofit and a policy community service type background. And that's not the natural growing ground for, for fintech. I think I was kind of naive. I had a lot of experience putting together these big partnerships and getting major financial institutions essentially to do what we wanted. Um, so I thought, oh, well, this will be fairly easy, right? Like we're going to create this technology. I know it makes sense. It's going to help the banks out. It's going to help their customers. Let's just go and do it. Of course, it hasn't been that easy or that fast, but really just this idea of somebody needs to build the technology that can make this happen. And I was absolutely convinced that it was the right thing to do and that it made business sense. So, I mean, number one, I knew that it made business sense. I mean, Banks really don't want to see their borrowers go into delinquency, default, and foreclosure. They do lose money. Saw an opening where it really wasn't in their wheelhouse to do that, nor would it make sense for them to do that. So, I mean, we just decided to do it. And um, you don't know what you don't know, right, until you don't know. But I just thought we would try. And I think because I had always worked from the nonprofit side, I really felt strongly I wanted it to be a business. I wanted it to be a for-profit business where the banks would pay for the solution. Because frankly, I felt that they had helped create the problem that we were trying to solve. And so I thought it made sense that they should pay for the solution. So it sounds like one advantage, it's not obvious, but one advantage is that if you work in nonprofit, you're always thinking about funding because who's going to pay for this, right? So to what extent did that help you gain a foothold to say, to go start with funding first, meaning a revenue model and stuff like that. How did that play in? And did it, how did it influence your thoughts about, for example, pricing or even coming up with a revenue model? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good question. And I like how you related it to the fundraising of a nonprofit, because when you work for a nonprofit, you can't do anything until you have funding. And I believe that's how I've always approached everything we do at Spring 4 is we have to have a way to pay for it. And I don't think that's the approach of a lot of organizations today, particularly fintech companies or startups. It's like, well, I have this idea. Let me go raise a bunch of money and then I'll see if it works. I'm not of that school at all. And we've always, and this is how we run our company is you figure out how to create something that somebody's going to pay for. And then, you know, you put that back into the business and you use that to do your next product enhancement or bring on your next team member. I'm very fiscally conservative or responsible with our company and our revenue. So that's just the way I believe in it. And I I think it's important to note when we started Spring 4, I didn't have this idea, oh, we're, we're a startup. Oh, we're a fintech. It was just like, no, we see this problem. I think we have a solution. We're going to build it a little bit, but then we're going to go get somebody to pay for it. And to me, that's how business should be done. Which I agree with you. I mean, you prove the economics first and everything else follows. So then what funding strategy did you adopt? Because technology obviously requires investment up front before you can actually deliver. So did you get banks to believe in you and advance monies to build a solution? Or did you get investment just from venture capitalists? How did you think about that? Yeah, no. And now remember, this is like 2005, 2006. So um, no, my partner and I, we put in a small amount of money to start the company. And at the time, I was very scared to do that. My husband actually encouraged us to do this. And I was like, oh my God, but that's so much money. And I'll I'll (laughs) tell you, it was $5,000. That's really not very much money at all, but it made me so nervous. But we went ahead and we did it. And no, we have never taken any money from any outside investors. We have not raised capital. We're revenue generating and profitable. We went out and we got contracts. That's brilliant. 
I feel very encouraged to hear that because we know that funding is a huge barrier to women entrepreneurs. And hearing you speak about this gives me hope, and I'm sure it gives many more women hope that you don't necessarily have to have a big VC firm writing out big checks to build something that's sustainable and has the potential for growth. I think that's kind of sexy and it's exciting and you get written up a lot. You know, I think the the media is very interested in that story of raising capital, but at the end of the day, you know, that doesn't create a sustainable business. And, you know, think about it. They're just taking a bet on you among many other companies and they don't have to see you succeed for them to succeed. So, so then you get the funding. It's a small amount of funding. You're very prudent in terms of not betting the farm. You go out and get contracts and then you start growing, right? What Can you talk a little bit about like the early stages where there are hitches or glitches? You know, did oh. things not work out? How did you deal with those? How did you placate your customers, still make sure that you're serving your ultimate customers, which is both the nonprofits that are providing the counseling for your banks and other institutions, as well as the end consumer, the one who's actually in financial distress? I mean, there are a lot of moving parts here and a lot of stakeholders. And if there are glitches, you know, you have kind of like a multiple effect versus just like one customer and you, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the downsides to not raising capital is that your growth is very slow. Um, But I also think that's good in that we didn't have, you know, a ton of glitches. I think that a lot of people who have big budgets, they bring in big engineering teams and tech teams and they try to build everything all at once, I think instead of like moving slowly and really understanding all of the pieces and working with banks, they have such a high reputational risk. And the fact that they're going to work with a company, you know, like ours is everything has to be perfect. That's not to say that sometimes we might have something in our data that needs to be changed or whatever. But I mean, for the large part, we just moved very conservatively, very slowly, made sure everything was right. And then, you know, of course, like at the beginning, it was a very, very small project, very small pilots that we were doing. And so today we have a database that we're in 625 cities across the U.S. and growing. This makes me laugh, but it also I think is important for people to hear is like if you have a vision and a passion, you just have to go out and sell it. And your authenticity and your belief in what you're building will come through because I look back on it and I remember pitching to a very large bank, like a top five bank. And I was like, we have five cities, but their customers are all over the country. So, I mean, that's not really the best solution for a lender that large. But I had that crazy belief that what we were building was the right thing. And so at the time, I didn't think that was crazy, but I look back at it now and it almost makes me cringe. And then did you ever write, this is like a tactical question, but did you ever write a business plan? You didn't need to because you didn't have any investors to satisfy or any milestones to achieve. Well, we sort of did. I mean, we kind of laid out like what our thought process was. It was a business plan, but again, we didn't really go out and get funding back in like 2000 or 2005, 2006 with that. So my co-founder and I, Dr. Michael Collins, he and I were doing consulting together. I kind of left that out, but I had left my job and we were consulting and we were working for large uh, mortgage servicers and foundations all around this idea of asset building and foreclosure intervention. And, you know, we, we put together, I would say, a very light business model. And I think it's important to keep it fluid too, just because you have something in your business model or your plan doesn't necessarily mean you have to stick to that because it's evolving and you're learning as you go. I'm not one of those people that is very rigid in writing everything down and going and following a strict plan. I feel like I'm more of like the creative type where I'm like, oh, okay, you know. But it sounds like the plan kind of gave you some boundaries, some landmarks to say, hey, did we veer too far off? Are we in the general direction? Did you go back to it like every couple of months or did you just say, you know what, I've got my thoughts on paper, I'm good to go? Well, I mean, there were a few things that were very important to us when we were building our company that are still true today, which I'm very proud of. Number one is we were never, ever going to charge a consumer who is experiencing financial distress to charge them money to access what we were building. That was just no wrong. And that wasn't something we were interested in. Secondly, all of the resources and nonprofits and uh, government resources that go into spring for we were never going to charge them to be in our system as well. There are lots of kind of not really things like us, but there are those models where an organization gets paid or pays to get listed. We wanted to be a trusted third party 
for this information. And then the third thing was we were never going to charge our bank clients on the number of referrals that they made or the number of referrals that they utilized Spring for, for, because to me, that would create a real disincentive for them to help their customers. We wanted at the end of the day, everything that we do is around how can we help as many consumers as possible? And so that's all of those things are still true today. And I'm really proud of that because it says that we knew from the beginning what was important to us. We knew how we wanted to create impact. And I didn't know about social impact companies when we started our company, but I'm very clear on the fact that we are a social impact company and we always have been from day one. And looking back on it, I think that's pretty amazing. And I think that's because we were rooted in the community. We didn't start our company because we wanted to start you know, a company <laughs> yeah. start a company and make a zillion dollars and then go sell it. There's nothing wrong with that, but that wasn't the, our mindset. Were. Yeah. yeah, which is a great segue to my next question, B Corp. So that's not a to- topic that many entrepreneurs know about. I think it's in- increasing in awareness now. Uh, can you just walk me through the process of like, how, when did you become aware of it? Why did you consider it? What was the process like? And what benefit do you get as a result? Sure. Uh, we're a certified B Corp. I believe it was 2016 that we became a certified B Corp. So much later on in the process of becoming, you know, a company, but I not sure what the year is that certified B even came into play. But I will say, I think it's something like it probably is difficult for a company. Like if there are people who are interested in that, like, I think you kind of need to establish yourself as a company first. There's a lot of paperwork involved and a lot of documentation of who you are as a company, why you do things. Um, Let me back up a little bit to be a certified B corporation, you have to commit to um, increased social and environmental standards. So for our company, environmental is much less of our measurement because for the most part, we're a remote company. So our impact on the environment is very small. But you could imagine if you were a large company and doing lots of things to lessen your environmental impact, you'll have a high score on that. And ours is more on the social impact side of our business. But you have to do a lot of documentation. And I just think until you're like really I don't want to say a real company, but have like a lot of your processes in place. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's not going to make much sense for you. And it would be really hard to do, but essentially, you know, we learned about it and we thought, wow, we're already a social impact company and it would be good to have a stamp of approval that says to our clients into the world that we are an impact company. And so why not try to get this stamp of approval for our company? So it sounds like you had to have your model, your direction, and your processes pretty much nailed. Yeah, you can't fake it till you make it with the certified report. <laughs> no, I can't they, imagine yeah. you would. No, they. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very uh, rigorous. You go through like an online assessment and questionnaire, and then you have follow up with staff to go through all your documents. You submit all of it. It takes a while. And then now there's a requirement even that you have to legally change your corporate status to a benefit corporation. So, and then I would imagine that there are ongoing requirements too, so that they can be satisfied that you're actually sticking to the things. Yeah. Yes. It's every uh, three years. Okay. You pay a fee to, I mean, it covers all of their work, but administrative costs, certification. Yeah. Yeah. So from the time that you let's say officially started the process till you got the stamp that said, Hey, now you're a certified B Corp. How long did that take you? Oh gosh. I mean, several months at least, okay. but probably a little bit longer than that. But definitely like a single year type commitment versus like a two, three year type commitment. Oh, under a year. Under a year. Okay. Yeah. So now we'll kind of switch gears a little bit and move to kind of the ongoing running of the business as a CEO How does finance enter the picture for you? Like, what do you view as your role with regard to finance and how do you address the financial side of your business? Well, I have a COO, my right-hand person, who's also a partner in our company. So he does the majority of the finance. Also, almost since day one, we engaged a CPA and she does all of our you know, accounting work, we utilize them for our payroll and bookkeeping, and they guide us on all the kind of issues that you don't even know exist until (laughs) they come across your desk. 
my role as CEO, I feel like I'm really helping set the stage strategically. I'm our visionary about like what we're doing, why we're doing it, where we're going. I do a lot of the preliminary sales work, really trying to get people interested in our company, what we do and why we do it. Of course, as CEO, you're helping make decisions where you're spending money, what your budgets look like, all of those things. But I would say for me, that is not my primary focus. Thank goodness. I think it's also really important to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. And that is not my area of expertise. I mean, I have a master's in urban planning and policy. I don't have an MBA. I think that is completely fine and okay. But there are times where I do wish I had a little bit more of that expertise or understanding all the ins and outs of P&L and balance sheets and things like that. But I don't want anyone to think that if they don't have that, you can't start a business. You just have to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you on those things. So there are two kind of follow-up questions I want to ask you on that, because that's like the heart of what a lot of women entrepreneurs deal with in terms of challenges. So first question is, you talked about hiring CPAs and other, what I'll call broadly financial professionals, right? They may be IP attorneys, they may be CPAs. Mm -hmm. How quickly did you do that? You said you started with a very small budget of $5,000. Like how quickly did you say, hey, I, the first thing I need to do is to get a CPA because I might be getting into trouble, even how I incorporate my business and is a C-carb and typically yeah. CPAs help with that. How quickly did you get help? So yeah, just to, if my partner also put in five, so it was $10,000, but yeah, good point. Still yeah. a very small amount of money. Um, well, right away, we did engage with a lawyer and a CPA for incorporation and getting all of our legal documents in there. But I think it's important if you can to find people that can help you, but then they scale and grow with you. So when we first started out, we didn't have our CPA doing as much as they do now for us because we couldn't afford it. And then like, as we've grown, they take on payroll. I mean, heck, for the first several years, nobody was even getting paid. So there was no payroll. So things like that. And I think like just asking people, other small business owners, who do they utilize for certain business functions? And I think probably it's even easier today. There are like all kinds of online companies now that you can just utilize for like HR functions or accounting or payroll. I think I tend to be attracted more towards like small business owners, you know, mom and pop type providers. Yeah. Like my CPA firm is a woman led, you know, CPA firm. She also happens to be an attorney. So she can also provide some quasi legal advice when we need to, but has been helpful in connecting me to attorneys at the right time as well. And then the second follow-up question I had was, you mentioned, and I think a lot of people, this will resonate with a lot of people, is like finance is not your strong point. Yet, the moment you're a founder, CEO, anyone who has responsibility for stewardship of the company, there's some bare bones level of familiarity, fluency with some numbers, right? Which numbers are those for you? How often do you look at those? And what do you think is good advice for somebody who's struggling to say, okay, I don't know finance, but I need to get to like a bare level of competence? Well, revenue, number okay. one, <laughs> you know, bringing in new sales and revenue and just knowing how much money we need to have in our bank to cover our payroll. Those are the numbers that I pay attention to and like retention of our clients and figures like that. And then working with my CEO, you know, he provides me with the reporting and then, you know, we have meetings to talk about where we're at, where we need to be. Let's talk about growth. I know that unfortunately, there's probably going to be a big continuing need for the kinds of services that you provide. How do you think about growth for your business? What are your aspirations and how are you gearing yourself up both in terms of kind of your operating footprint as well as your financial base to grow in future? We do approach growth conservatively. So when we hire and bring more people onto our team, I really want to be in a position where I know that this person can be on our team for the long haul, the long term. I would never want to bring somebody on and then have to let them go because we don't have the revenue to support that position. So I do think we tend to hire, I don't want to say later, but we're just really careful about 
when we hire. We also have a large group, not large, but you know, a substantial amount of subcontractors that work with us that do our some of our work, our data work, our tech work. So thinking smart about who needs to be hired. Like for us, it never made sense to bring in-house tech. I think a lot of startups go out and hire their tech teams, but if you're not every day developing and building that tech, I don't know if that's the best use of money, but as far as like our vision, I mean, I think that every single company ought to have a financial health strategy. And part of that strategy is connecting people to resources when they need them. So that is my vision. COVID-19 and the pandemic really helped uncover the fact that a vast majority of Americans are not doing well financially. In fact, I would argue that there is not one person that has not had the effect of of the pandemic affect their finances. You know, the vast majority, yes, we have been hurt financially. We know that when businesses help their workers and their customers, it is good for their brand. It's good for their company. It's good for their employee morale, and it helps people get back on track. So to me, that says that every company ought to be looking at and engaging in financial health and wellness opportunities. We need to move the focus from just product, product, product to what are the services that go around products when we're offering products to consumers. So here's what I took away. And it's fascinating in terms of your growth. What I'm hearing is number one is you have to lead with, first of all, keep your operating footprint light, right? To the point of keeping your costs variable, hiring subcontractors and so on and so forth, so that you can offer some level of security and stability to the people that you do actually take on board as employees. The second, to me, more interesting message is, as you think about growth, it's not just, I want to grow 5% or 10%, but I'm almost hearing you say, where's the green fields, right? What are the big clumps or clusters of opportunity that are adjacent to your core product and the problem it solves for your customers and their customers? And then you orient your growth towards those areas of opportunity, and then you figure out what the numbers look like to fulfill that opportunity or to exploit that opportunity, which is I hadn't thought about that before. And it's absolutely fascinating that you put it that way. I just want to make sure I heard you right. And that's how you think about growth. That is how I think about growth, because I am really motivated about making a change in how we're dealing with this situation in our country. And so I'm not, I suppose, like looking at it like, well, you know, 20% of this market, if we could capture, you know, 10%, then we're doing really well. I we're bringing innovation and change to the industry. And in order to do that, you, what is the big picture that you're trying to change? What is the problem that you're trying to solve and get people to connect on an emotional level? Because I think that's when you're able to create change and, and positive change. This is the stuff that keeps me excited. I'm seeing this clear pattern in terms of I mean, not to generalize or stereotype, but I'm just seeing a very qualitative difference between how women entrepreneurs think about growth and what success means versus the traditional story you've been told about. We need to aim for 20% growth. And then you work back and say, okay, what markets do you want to you know, attack next to, to achieve that growth? So that's fascinating. We talked a little bit about the financial side of your business and kind of how you feel about it. Any additional thoughts going forward? Do you have any thoughts or what thoughts do you have on building your financial you know, the the comfort level that you talked about earlier with numbers, profit and loss statements, is that on your radar? And how would, if you had to do it, how would you do it? Given that you're a busy CEO and probably have other commitments, family, personal, and not much time. I'm just a firm believer in bringing people on your team that have expertise that you don't, that you can trust and build relationships with, and that are connected to your mission, that share the same passion for what you're trying to build. I'm really quite comfortable with not being the expert in that. But yes, to understand what that means and for what it means for our company and our growth and where we need to be and things like that, then yes, absolutely. And connecting with mentors and other people that have like CEOs that have bigger companies and maybe have raised capital or are in corporate America versus us and our small company and learning from that and trying to figure out good tactics and good practices to have in place. One other thing on the business side, uh, one issue that I personally struggle with, and I know many women do, is this question of negotiation. So you have to negotiate deals wherever you start a business, whatever it is, whether it's an employee salary, how the terms of your financing are, whatever it is, pricing on your contracts, negotiation is number one. 
How comfortable did you feel and do you feel negotiating and how did you approach negotiating effectively so that your company's interests were not jeopardized? Yeah, that is not a fun. I mean, I don't think most people relish it, but I do think there there does seem to be a difference between male, female and and the comfortableness of negotiating it. I would say it's not something that I love to do, but it is one of those things I said before, like, don't fake it till you make it. This is one of those things like fake it till you make it. I feel <laughs> like I would say the majority of people are, are uncomfortable with it. And you just have to make certain that they don't know that. And you have to be very confident in whatever you are negotiating. And I think you have to remember your value and what you're bringing to the table. For us, we have to think about everything that has gone into whatever is part of that proposal today. I mean, if somebody wants to purchase spring force products today. I mean, they're not just getting this stagnant thing that we just built yesterday. They're getting 16 years worth of our hard work. And they're also capitalizing on our track record and reputation and the trust that we've built. And I think there is, you know, a price on that. And so that is part of like when we price things out and our negotiation. And I also just flexibility and really listening to your customer. And if they're telling you something, figuring out a way that you might be able to say, okay, let me take this back and come back to you with some ideas so that they feel heard because everybody wants to feel heard. And I also think it's good to present choices. So never just give somebody one price tag because (laughs) everybody wants to kind of you know, a triplicate of choice. That's like an old thing. Like it's like, you don't want to be seen as the cheapest. You don't want to pay the most. So you're probably going to come in the middle. So if like the middle is where you want to land, like I actually learned that from my husband who's in sales. Uh-huh. So, but I will say what I realized is that I have been in sales my entire career because I worked at a nonprofit and I did advocacy and I had to go get funding, you know, yes, it's sales. So It's just a different sort of sales. That's great. So it sounds like overall, what I'm hearing is soft approach, fact-based, credible, respecting the counterparty and what, and really hearing what they want and trying to incorporate what's important to them in the offering you're giving them. And then allowing choice so that they feel that they have freedom to do what is the best for them based on their understanding of their needs. Exactly. And then I would just say one piece of advice, if you were like doing a proposal or negotiating, if at the end of the day, you're not going to feel good about where you end up, that's not good. You have to be excited. You have to get paid for what you believe your value that you're bringing. So that's always important to keep in mind too. And I think that also can help you say no when you should say no. Like we don't have to say yes to everything. If somebody isn't going to pay you or your company, what for what you think the true value is of whatever you're offering, then it's okay to walk away. There'll be another client because you want to have that mutual respect and value for what you're providing. Let's talk a little bit about uh, network and access. So one of the things that the research has proved that blocks women entrepreneurs from being more successful is that they don't have access to the networks, whether it's a lawyer, a venture capitalist, even somebody who knows people who you need to hire. To what extent was this an issue for you uh, and how did you get access to networks that are important to you? I think it's a lot easier today than it was 15 years ago, but definitely at the outset, at the beginning, really tapping into your existing network. So I was working with my existing bank clients or bank contacts at the time. But I think today there's a lot more entities available around like women, women founders, like tapping into those networks. But I'm a firm believer in never burning any bridges and always really being helpful to people within personal and business. And so if you do that, I think you can reach out to people and you can connect to them and you can you know, ask for help. I think by nature, women want to be helpful and we want to share connections and we want to network. I think that's crucial. And I'm a connector. So I want to try and help connect people, you know, where it makes sense and be of service. Like I think our team and I try to impress upon our team at Spring4, how can we be in service to our clients or to our contacts? Because everybody likes that and everybody is looking for 
ways to grow, whether it's their own individual company or their own individual career path or just the deal they're working on. But I do think you have to like get outside yourself, take some risks, go to events and and put yourself out there. And you it's okay to ask for help or ask if somebody knows someone or can they help connect you. And I think just making sure you ask and people I believe will tell you if they don't want to or it doesn't feel right to them. But most people will say, oh yeah, sure, no problem. Just out of curiosity, do you consider yourself an extrovert or an introvert? <laughs> I don't know. I think I I play both well. Like I really like my alone time, but you know, take me to a conference or a cocktail party or a networking event. I'm definitely an extrovert. And you're not tired at the end. Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. Definitely tired. So you're just a but, very high functioning introvert. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, but I I mean I also like appreciate a good networking event because that is how you get things done and that's how you meet people. Especially if you're bringing a brand new idea to someone or something. I mean, we don't we're not like, I don't know, Coca-Cola or McDonald's. Like we don't do ads. Not we're not like a household name. So yeah. you got to get out there and hustle. You do have to like connect with everyone you know on LinkedIn and make a conscious effort to like grow that presence and join things. I joined the women technology program out of 1871. I joined 1871, which was for startups, yeah. different things like that to help put my company on the map and try to grow my professional network and basically have more eyes on spring four and what we're doing. So looking back, what do you think have been kind of like your top three or four biggest learnings from this whole entrepreneurial journey to date? Mm -hmm. I would say if I had to describe myself, I would say I am not a patient person, but when I look at what our company has done and is doing and how long it's taken us, I'm like, wow, we are really patient people. I mean, if you're trying to sell into a major financial institution or corporation and you're bringing change, that is not something that happens quickly. We have deals that have taken four years, you know, and then you have other clients who it takes 60 days. It just is all over the place for us, but it has taught me patience. So that's number one. Number two is somebody once told me, no doesn't mean no until they tell you no, which I think is really helpful, especially in the current day and age where you get ghosted or people don't yes. reply. They don't reply to you. But now that I've learned, like, well, until they tell me no, it's not a no. And it is true. Like I just keep thinking of ways to keep in touch with people. And it's not a matter of like, have you made a decision yet? Or, you know, all about spring four. It's like, oh, I saw this article. I thought you might be interested, or we're always putting together our pieces of research or information or sharing an article with a client that or potential client that we think would be helpful and kind of doing it that way. And then um, the power of delegation and building a team and giving your team the power and ability to be an important integral part of your company. So I, th I think that's really important. I, I want to empower everybody on our team to have their area of expertise and be able to contribute to our company and make decisions and, and feel good about their job. How, how do you think that being a woman has shaped this journey? And I would say, how has it affected the way you think about it, your strategy and your approach going forward? Oh, gosh, I do think it is so relevant. I think the fact that we are an impact and mission oriented company, I think has a lot to do with being a woman and wanting to create impact. I think I don't have the stats, but there is some stat out there that when you look at men and women, like the type of companies a man um, chooses to found versus those that women found is definitely more on the impact side, the more of the like, this is what we want to change the world type of companies versus male dominated companies. I, I mean, I think it has made things difficult. I mean, I will say that there have been many times where I wonder where our company would be if we were a male led company especially in fintech, you don't see many women-led fintech companies and 
with the results that we have and the companies that we're working with, I'd like to see who those other companies are that stack up against us. But we haven't really tried to raise venture capital because that isn't what we wanted to do for our company. You know, when I look back at my career and starting this company, I wish that 15 years ago, I would have had the confidence that I have today because I I didn't. And I didn't tap in early enough to my authenticity and passion for what we do. And it, and that is helpful. It's helpful to our journey and it helps sell what we do. I think at the beginning, I was just so nervous about having the right business answer and having a, a presentation be a certain way or just like thinking that it had to be a certain way. What advice would you give someone who wants to follow in your footsteps, a woman who wants to start a fintech company, you know, regardless of how much social impact there is? What? Well, I think you have to understand that you should be tackling a problem that needs to be solved. So without that, it doesn't make sense to go down that road of creating a company. And then it should be something that you do feel passionate about. Because like I said, I think it does help sell. It helps you stay committed on those dark days or like ride all the ups and downs and then go out and validate that. And when you say that there's a problem, are there markers or hints you can give to somebody to say, how do you know what, what do you need to see or feel? to know that it's a real problem and not just something that is unique to you? Well, you have to go out and you have to ask. You have to find other people that are experiencing that problem. Gotcha. And for you, that happened through your own natural experience of working with these financial services companies. Yeah. Although I do have a personal connection to it. I did not come from a family with a lot of money and we did have to rely on outside resources at different times growing up. And I always felt really embarrassed and ashamed. I always wanted my family to have more money and I always tried to hide that part of myself. So I think that's where that connection to let's remove the stigma attached to financial challenges. Things happen to people every day and it's not not a result of anything that they did wrong or did right. I mean, you know, tomorrow one of us could have a, a medical catastrophe and with the way healthcare is that can ruin you financially. That's yeah. nobody's fault. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, so we'll leave with one last question. So if you had your wildest dreams come true, uh, what is your vision for Spring for? Oh, it's like what I said earlier, that this is something that is part of every company, just like almost every company today provides access to health insurance or benefits to mental health counseling or being your whole health, whole self. I think financial health and wellness is really important. It affects every other aspect of our lives. And so we need to catch up as an industry and help ah. put those things in place that makes everybody have a better or an increased opportunity for financial health because it's better for everybody. Fantastic. For Thank you. Thank you very much. Talking to Rochelle was a big learning experience for me in many ways. Number one was the way in which she and her co-founder laid out pretty early on some core principles they'd never violate no matter what the situation was. Doing this as early as they did helped make a lot of downstream decisions easy, if not complete non-issues, and made her path much clearer and more definitive. The second was when she decided to hire licensed professionals like lawyers and accountants who would keep her and her startup out of trouble even though she didn't have millions in funding. She hired them to help her avoid fatal mistakes, but was smart enough to only spend what she absolutely needed to. It was not an all or nothing proposition. The last, and in my view, the best, was her very creative approach to growth. When we hear about growth, we usually hear targets in terms of a percentage or even in terms of new products or territories. In other words, the bottom line is the driver. But Rochelle started with her desired impact, which can also be measured and work back to find out what that meant in terms of growth and how much of that growth ambition was affordable given where she and her startup was. I love this idea of affordable, mission-maximizing growth. So how can you clarify, protect, and leverage your mission, whether socially driven or not, to get the most bang for your startup buck? Thanks for listening to today's episode. We have show notes and more at achieve.co. That's A-C-H-I-I-V dot co forward slash podcast like what you heard 
hit subscribe and share with a friend. See you on the next episode. Now, go be an achiever.